Well, swell, good. Uh, so my name is Kelly Andrews. I'm the developer advocate with CodeShip. CodeShip is a CI/CD platform uh, that lets you deliver your software uh, quickly. So if you haven't heard of it, you should definitely check it out. If you don't want to check it out, that's fine. I won't be hurt. Um, I hear you guys like your talks to be short, so I'll keep it as sweet uh, and and quick as possible. But I have done this a lot, so um, if you feel like I'm moving too fast or saying something that you don't understand, feel free to throw your hand up. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll take interjections uh, as they come. So uh, my Twitter handle is down here where you can't see it because I'm too large and block most of the screen. So I'm going to slide over here to the side. Um, if you want to follow me, it's the easiest way. To, if you have questions or anything about anything we present tonight, uh, you can hit me up there. Anybody currently in a DevOps role? ish cool so this is going to not pertain to anybody no i'm just kidding um how many of you are doing like test driven development or you know that kind of thing today all right cool y'all are going to learn something tonight i hope you learn what you're not doing maybe um okay so let's get started uh what is exactly continuous testing Right, so continuous testing is essentially just a process uh, where you're running tests throughout the entire deployment pipeline. Which sounds like a lot of stuff, uh, but a, when you're doing kind of test-driven development or you have a QA team, a lot of these things happen as you go uh, and you may not even realize it, but it tends to start sort of at the developer with uh, unit testing. As you're developing, you, you write tests those tests fail, you write so, uh, the software to make those tests pass. That's kind of like the standard TDD uh, mantra. Once you, um, once you start adding unit testing into it, then there's other pieces, which I'll cover in a second. Uh, but it, it extends through the entire software delivery pipeline. They kind of look like this, right? When you run one test, you run them all, and they all should come out with basically the same answer. So let's Let's talk about why repeatable is necessary. If I have to do any manual intervention, intervention in my testing, uh, I've already sort of failed myself because now I have to uh, manually do something and it's no longer automated, right? So the, the trick to continuous testing is you want this to be as automated as possible. So having one test, if you run it a thousand times, always produces the same answer. So that's sort of where you want your test to be as repeatable as possible. Every time you run them, they always kind of give you the same result and then you know your software is working. They have to be easy to maintain. Maintenance on tests is a pain. Uh, and if you talk to a lot of developers, they'll all kind of tell you that the thing that they, they like the least is making sure that all the tests are you know, written for the code that they write. Um, it's an unfortunate like necessity uh, because if you really want to get your testing done right, you sort of have to write them first. Uh, and it's a it's kind of a vicious cycle. But when you you kind of look at the amount of time it takes to write these tests, you you end up spending about as much time writing tests sometimes as you end up writing code. So they they are definitely valuable because if you see something break early in a test pipeline, you can fix it sooner as opposed to waiting until later to find out something doesn't work right. Uh, so while it seems like a cost uh, upfront, it's it's actually a savings uh, down the line. They need to be thorough. So you don't want to test like five things when you have like 50 features, right? You want to try to test as much as you can. Now, it doesn't mean you have to necessarily be at 100% coverage uh, line by line, but you want to be able to test most of the functionality and make sure it's all doing what you need it to do. If it, it, at this point, it's all about confidence, right? How confident are, are you? Um, so if you can get your confidence level high enough that every test that goes through you feel good about, then you're probably going to be okay. Environmentally consistent. This is always a tough one, right? There's the developer's machine, there's a staging environment, there's a production environment, maybe there's a QA environment, and they're all slightly different. So then you try running your code on each one, and maybe one breaks, and oh, i got to change this to make sure it works in production. Um, if you can streamline 
from the development machine all the way to production that they are as environmentally consistent as possible, you're going to really save yourselves a lot of hurt. Um, I mean, one of the ways that I used to do this was literally we'd check out code from a staging server, uh, test it on the staging server, and then we'd switch it in Dreamweaver to you know the production, and then push it out to production, and it was awful and miserable, and um, usually didn't work right the first time. So, environmentally consistent is definitely helpful because it's just going to make sure that what you're testing is actually going to be the same result as what's going to production. So what are some different types of tests? Well, there's like smoke tests, which essentially, you know, like if you hear the phrase, if there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, it's sort of a low level test just to make sure that things aren't broken. Um, not necessarily a whole like s suite of tests, but just some, some small things to say, hey, this is really broken and just stop everything right here. Um, and it, it will kind of be sort of your first indication on whether or not things are, are going well or not. Unit tests. Unit tests, you're going to take the smallest piece of code, usually a function of some kind. You're going to run a test on that, uh, determine whether or not it's re pre uh, returning exactly what you expect. Um, and you go through each one of these pieces, each one of these small units, and you make sure they're doing exactly what they should do as an individual, as isolated as possible, right? So you're not, uh, there's not other things integrated with it. Uh, because then you actually can run what's called integration tests, where you take each one of these units, couple them together, and sort of run through some different tests to make sure those integrations are actually doing what they should do. When you take all those different pieces and put them all together, now you have what's called systems test, which is probably what a lot of people look at as integrations test um, until I kind of really dug into the definitions uh, and got nitpicky about it. it I always kind of considered system testing integration testing. In a way it is because you're integrating all these things together. You're just doing it on a system wide level, right? So I'll show you some code in a little bit of how I run RSpec uh, on my Ruby project. And essentially, it is testing the API to make sure that the API does what I want it to do. So I'm not testing each individual function. I'm not testing how each function works with one another. I'm just testing sort of the API to make sure it does what I need. And that has me confident enough to do what I need it to do. Once you get past system testing, there's actually acceptance testing, which is sort of taking a candidate for release and determining whether or not it's satisfied all of the business requirements or not. Uh, and it's usually sort of the last gateway into uh, deployment. So it kind of looks like this in a deployment pipeline. This is a very simplistic pipeline. Uh, most people's uh, are going to be way more complex than this, but just to kind of boil it down into an essence, uh, continuous testing happens between all the way between development and production, all the way through uh, each step. And it's not necessarily that all of the tests run at once. You may do mostly unit testing on this end, but on the production, just before it goes to the production side, you're doing more of an acceptance test. Um, so you're not necessarily running the entire battery of tests that you have written or you know, QAing the entire product. You're sort of doing it throughout the entire process. So what that's going to help with is as you, go through, as you go through the pipeline, you're catching errors much sooner. That way you're not waiting until you're about to deploy to production to find out there's five bugs that everybody missed. Everybody with me so far? Cool. Okay, continuous integration, right? So what does that mean? Well, it's basically taking all of your code that you write on a regular basis and merging it back into a main line on an ongoing practice, right? So as opposed to everybody works on a branch for three weeks and then we all try to merge it together, which ends up with uh, all kinds of headaches and merges and causes just a whole host of problems which I'll kind of walk through here but um, being able to essentially commit code to a mainline branch every day would be great two or three times a day even better but it keeps again it goes back to that confidence level in your code and catching things early so some key tenets to continuous integration, you have uh, automated builds. So what you don't want to have, what you want to reduce in your entire pipeline is the amount of manual intervention that you do have to do. So having automated builds to uh, create, the, 
create the artifact from that commit, run through the testing that needs to be tested uh, from the previous step, run through all that, make sure everything checks uh, without you having to do it, and then during the code review, it's you're looking for things like, you know, style or, uh, you know, various minor things compared to this actually works, and you know it works because the build has already happened and the tests have ran. Uh, so it needs to be self-tested, right, which is sort of redundant in, in my part here, but essentially, if, again, it's all, it, there's an automation piece to this that you really have to think through, and as a sort of a DevOps practice, that's kind of what they do. Um, so maybe if you have DevOps people go shake their hand because they're doing a lot more than you probably think they are. Um, at least I've grown to learn that. Um, but essentially self-testing is it's going to automatically build, it's going to automatically self-test. There is no person pushing buttons, waiting for things to happen, running through a checklist, anything like that. It's kind of streamlined and, and automatic. And every commit should be built, right? If you're committing code, and you're gonna commit that code into a mainline branch, you should know that it's gonna work, right? So if you build it and test it every single time, you'll know way ahead of the game if there's, a, if there's an issue. Uh, and then you can resolve that issue much faster. Otherwise you end up with things like this, where everybody's trying to, let's start it from the beginning, thank you. Everybody's trying to merge their code in all at the same time. Anybody ever done this? Yeah, it's miserable, right? Um, sorry, I really love this. I don't know what movie this is from, so if anybody wants to tell me afterward. I thought it was Monty Python. It's definitely not, but it's hilarious. Uh, it's so, so perfect. Um, so when does continuous integration happen? Well, you have your development. Uh, you're developing on your local machine. You commit code. Somewhere in that region in the middle is where the continuous integration happens. It's an ongoing process, it's not something, I mean, the best practices for these uh, tend to be, you know, like there's one mainline branch and everyone commits right to it, uh, and that build gets, you know, built out. A lot of people, in, you know, will em employ like a PR type system, uh, which is what I'm used to, so I'll, I'll create a quick branch, do my changes, and then I'll commit back to the master branch with a PR. Um, kind of the main thing to think about is you don't want to have these feature branches with multiple developers and all these different things happening and it's, you know, three or four week process, right? Because software, the way we used to deliver it was every year or so they'd, they'd make a release and it'd be full of bugs and, um, you know, kind of problematic. So it's something that you want to do. Like the better practice now is to sort of do this ongoing. All right, so let's move on to continuous delivery. So continuous delivery, much in the same vein, it's an automated process, uh, but it's the, you're essentially producing an artifact that is deployable at any time. Um, every time you go through a continuous integration, you're, you should theoretically have something that is ready to go. Now this doesn't mean you're actually deploying it, it means that you are actually getting to a point where it's releasable, uh, and then Typically, in the release cycle, you'll see a manual step to actually release it. But the continuous delivery is going to happen sort of in the middle here uh, again as well. Um, as, you, as you're committing your code and creating these build artifacts, if any of those uh, are deemed worthy of release, they can be flagged and pushed out the door as software. Again, it goes back to the earlier you find things, the, the quicker you can get them out uh, and automate the whole process in that regard. All right, so let's look at the difference between delivery and deployment. So continuous deployment is just taking that and re now releasing it automated. So CodeShip actually releases their software automated. What we do is we have a process of tests that get ran uh, whenever we build into our main branch. Uh, it will then create a staging server. We deployed our staging server, run a few tests there, make sure it's good to go. If it's working on our staging server, um, then we deem it worthy of deployment and we ship it. We ship it right to master at that point. So it goes right out to production. Um, so once we kind of commit code and we know that every, all the tests have run and we integrate it and merge that into our main branch, 
it's out the door. So what are some key tenets of these? Uh, reliability. Uh, the more often you are delivering software, the more reliable it can be, uh, which sounds a little counterintuitive, but if you're releasing software quickly, uh, you can A, know if there's a bug faster and roll back. You can uh, determine whether or not, um, lost my train of thought. So, okay, so if you, um, if you are deploying these smaller segments, you should have less code, less bugs introduced into the rest of the product. So it should be a little, uh, little more reliable just as software in general, uh, as opposed to the old fashioned way where you're doing it in long, longer, uh, longer release cycles, which then cause all kinds of bugs and you have patches afterwards, that kind of thing. Um, so this will this will kind of let you get to a state that's a little more reliable software-wise. Uh, it does allow for then incremental improvements, right? So instead of trying to bundle one huge feature all at once in six weeks and ship that whole big thing, now you can sort of slowly do it. Uh, you can kind of start with one piece, get that done, go to the next one, and what that will lead to then is also immediate feedback from the customer. So one of the projects we just went through with CodeShip was we had a UI redo uh, that we wanted to update a bunch of stuff. And we started with sort of where we thought was a good place to start. And once we kind of got through that, then we had feedback directly from our customers that said, hey, we like this, we don't like this, we hate this, this is great. Uh, why did you change this? Go back to the way it was, right? You know, all kinds of feedback. Um, if we had waited to sort of get where we thought we were done, we never would have gotten there, right? Um, so being able to go through these smaller improvements, getting the immediate feedback, turning that right back around as feedback into the product and delivering that product, customers are much happier now because they got exactly what they wanted and what they thought was, um, was the right direction for us. So it helped us deliver the right product at the right time. Continuous deployment is gonna happen definitely down the pipe. Uh, so once you sort of get uh, through the code commit and everything's built and you're at staging, you, know, you run acceptance testing, you run whatever tests you need to run in the staging side, and then you can deploy directly into the production. It's sort of a unicorn, I'm going to be honest with you. It's, um, but what you don't want to have happen is try to, you know, like imagine that guy's delivering a load of features and it doesn't quite work out, right? It's, um, I thought it was funny when I found it. I'm sorry, you guys don't, but <laughs> it's all right. Uh, so there's always obstacles. Uh, some of the obstacles you're going to find are like lack of automation. Um, as I kind of went through the entire process, there's automated, 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 you know, ma not manual, not manual, not manual. I, and I kind of talk a lot about that. Well, not having that is detrimental to the pipeline. So being able to streamline all of this into some sort of process that's automated will make your lives much easier, which is sort of why DevOps exists, because they can take whatever it is you're building locally and you commit that back in, and now all these things start to happen, and the software can get delivered in much less painful manner than it ever has been. Uh, again, back to the environmental inconsistencies, uh, that's, a, that's a pain. It's in, I'll show you how I feel like I've solved it. Um, it it's not necessarily the end all be all to it, but uh, there's definitely one way to do it, and I'm using I'm using Docker containers to actually do that. Um, it lets me kind of build my machine into what production environment's going to be um, without having to go to each machine. I can write it up in code. There's all kinds of ways to do it, but the environmental inconsistencies will, will nail you every time. If you're deploying something automatically into production and it's not exactly like it is on staging, who knows what you're going to get. You know, you may get bugs, you may get issues, and it's going to be a problem. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, dependencies are a big one, um, which 
when you use something like Docker, I'm able to control my dependencies a little easier. Uh, and I know that what's working locally and my dependencies are going to work downstream because it's the same package and image that I create. But yeah, when you have, you know, every time you add another developer to the line, you add another chance for somebody to use something different. Now I'm, I'm not a full-time Ruby developer. I'm a, more of a JavaScript node developer. And we saw this all the time. And I know that, you know, I used to, the way I used to get around environmental inconsistencies uh, was literally a VM and we'd load up Ubuntu and we'd have an isolated VM and this was that and it had all the packages and if you wanted to try a different one, you just created a new VM and installed everything again and it was a pain. It was, you know, a, kind of a, it was a logistical nightmare for all of us, right? We didn't want to keep up with that sort of thing. So, so it's definitely, a, yeah, it's definitely a problem and it's not isolated to Ruby. It's definitely all over the place, but, um, yeah, it's definitely an issue. Even incompatibility between databases, right? You get, you get one database in a set, you know, in a state that isn't really replicated throughout and all kinds of craziness can happen. So the last point I wanna make about obstacles is just the business or the management in general. Uh, we actually, at one of my previous jobs, we had a pretty good pipeline going. We were deploying software about every other day uh, we were making upgrades. Everybody was going right into the, the branch. The branches were open and closed on a regular basis, running like clockwork. And then the management came to us and said, the sales team can't keep up and they don't know what's going on. So you need to slow this down to once every two weeks and then we'll release it internally first. And then we'll two weeks later. We're, so we went from like every other day to like every other month, just like that, right? And it's, you're gonna hit that and it's, it's painful and it hurts and it makes me want to cry <laughs> even now it was a very emotional time uh, but we got through it and you know we still tried to automate everything but sometimes the, the business requirements just change on you and you can't run it the way you want to which is kind of why i say this is sort of a sort of an unobtainable unicorn of, of sorts because it's like here's the pinnacle of doing ci cd automated fully completely great pipeline and then here's like reality which has some of those pieces but not all of them and it's super frustrating and you know where you should be or where everybody you know people like me come in and tell you this is where you should be or what you need to be doing and um, it's really hard to get there so I understand that and I know that this is um, not 100% reality for everybody uh, but it's definitely something to achieve and, and strive for because if you can get there releasing software is just night and day different. Another, uh, another obstacle would be uh, uh, tests that are not configured or written. Oh, absolutely. That's, yeah, uh, which I guess I, I kind of gloss over a little bit. Um, but yeah, anywhere in that automation pipeline, right? And tests are a big one. Um, I mean, we had the point where, you know, let me, let me back up a little bit. Our continuous integration pipeline that was working great, we were deploying every other day, we had absolutely no unit tests too. So there was that, uh, which was not great, but um, you know, we were, we were flying by the seat of our pants and thought we were doing good stuff. But yeah, we had a whole suite of tests that were completely useless because nobody kept up with them. Uh, which goes back to my point about like easy to maintain, right? If you can't maintain your tests or keep them up, uh, Nobody will. I mean, that's just sort of how it goes. So you, yeah, but definitely a, a big obstacle is lack of testing or improper testing or you know any, anything that will give you a false positive kind of thing. Uh, so you're introducing bugs inadvertently even. So, all right, so let's kind of review some of the key concepts of the whole thing. You wanna make small, fast changes, right? So that's a big piece of this is, is you don't wanna do these two, three week long drawn out features as much as possible. You wanna commit code as often as possible. Even if it's small, subtle changes, just get them back in there so you know immediately whether or not your code is gonna work. Uh, because everyone around you is also developing and merging back into the main line. So if you're waiting two weeks, that main line you started with is different now. And you have to, it's, a, it's an ongoing process, but it's definitely, if you can get small, fast changes in, uh, you're gonna do yourself a, a lot of good. Uh, the trunk-based development where everything kind of goes back into one main trunk, um, that's another, it's really hard to achieve, but 
if you can make one, you know, one master branch and everything pipes right into that and you're only branching off a master and not making all these different long-lived branches like a production branch or a staging branch, um, you, you end up with a lot smoother of a process. Fast builds and tests. Uh, speed is key. I mean, you don't want to, everybody's probably seen the XKCD uh, where they're sword fighting and they say code's compiling. Uh, you don't want to spend like 25, 30 minutes waiting for all this stuff to build and run every time. That's just, it's not going to cut it. Um, under 15 is good. Under 10 is great. Um, most of my stuff is super simple, so it only takes like three or four minutes. But uh, just as fast as you can go to get things out the door, you're, you're in good shape. Again, reliability, uh, making sure your tests are reliable, making sure your environments are all consistent and reliable, making sure your product is uh, overall going to be reliable by doing these kind of core things, and automated. Uh, as much as I harp on it, as automated as you can make things, the better. All right, so let me run through. Uh, the demo won't take very long. I, I just want to kind of walk you through a few things. But essentially, I created a to-do API because when I'm making sample apps, that's usually where I go to um, just because it's easy to do. There's not a lot there, and it's kind of easy to understand. Uh, but I have my RSpec file, which is testing um, my, my Git route, Git by IDs, my posts, basically testing my patch, and my delete, and my delete all. So I go through, I run through each one of these, kind of do an overall systems check, make sure everything's running and doing what I want. I'm getting back the right JSON, I'm getting back uh, the right headers, I can pass things in, I can create and update and delete, and all those kinds of things. So this is what I run uh, frequently, just to make sure that as I'm coding, uh, I know that my, my system itself is working as I expect it to. From here, uh, what I, and I kind of mentioned it before, but I, I started leaning heavily on Docker. And the reason why I did this is I don't want to have to go through all these setup of Postgres and make sure I have all these different pieces running and all the right gems and I have all the right, you know, all the right different pieces uh, for Ruby to work. I wanted to isolate that as much as possible. I was also doing a Node version of this and a PHP version of this, and I've now done a Python version of this. And I don't want to set all of those up on my machine and make sure they all play nicely and don't interfere with each other. And so one way to isolate the environment is with Docker, uh, because it, it's essentially, you can think of it like a VM. It's not a VM, it's just a process that runs. So in this particular process, it's running, um, it's running a Ruby process and then eventually it will run my, my Rails server and all that. Um, but just to quickly run through this, I'm grabbing a Ruby image from the Docker store, which I can show you real quick here. Maybe. Oh. Uh, I'll come back to that. Hang on. I gotta, I gotta figure out what to hit. I don't have an escape button anymore. Uh, there we go. Okay. I got quick time recording. I didn't want to stop it. And it's crazy. Uh, it's all buttons. Okay. So Docker store has all kinds of uh, pre-built containers that you can download, images that you can use. Uh, so if you look down here, there's, you know, Ruby 227, Ruby 234, 241, all kinds of different versions here that I can use in different flavors of Linux, whether or not it's um, really small or really big. It's a different conversation, but um, they all kind of come with their own flavor of Linux installed, and then you have to install the requirements for that to work. Uh, so I'm using the Alpine flavor, which is super small uh, and great for production environments. But then I run my APK, which is my package manager, I add the pieces that I need for Ruby to, uh, for Rails to install and run. Um, and then I just kind of copy over my gem file from my, my host and my gem file lock. And I, I put all of those over and then I bundle install. And then when that's done, I actually copy everything over directly. Um, it's in an order from most 
least volatile to most volatile, and the reason why is there's a Docker caching involved. So if, as it goes down, if something breaks, everything below it has to rerun. So I try to put the thing that would run the most often at the bottom, and anything that doesn't update uh, further up. So my gem file didn't change very much, but my actual code would, so I would run that build more often. But this only gives me my Ruby instance and that process. It doesn't give me the full environment, which is where I'm trying to get to. So Docker has a tool called Compose, which allows me to run multiple services in containers at the same time. So much like the Ruby uh, image that I grabbed, I grab a Postgres image here. And I set up a to-do app user and DB. Um, set up a database URL here. Here's the command that I run when it fires up. The volumes let me map my host machine to my container, uh, as well as the ports. But the volumes is really important because that lets me code locally on my machine, but it changes in the container. And that container will restart, and I can see those changes immediately um, isolated without having to install my, my bundle locally and that kind of thing. So, so when I run all of that together, I can just do docker compose up. I ran this earlier, so most of it's cached, which means it didn't actually have to run anything. It just had to restart it. But you'll see it's booted in. Uh, it's running at zero 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 three thousand, which will give me local host uh, three thousand in my my actual browser here. That's going to throw an error because I haven't migrated everything which is super simple for me to do. I can just do docker compose execute and then I can do a, a rake db migrate which will magically create my tables and then I can go back over here reload it and now I have an empty array which means everything's working so if I go to postman I can actually send an API test that comes back Sorry for the screen flipping. Boom, right? So I know it's working. It's working locally. It's working on containers. So it, my containers represent the eventual Heroku instance that I will ship to. So the fun part here is once I have everything in Docker containers, running it on CodeShip is super simple. So I just have some services which look just like my Docker Compose. And this was basically all I've been like doing the last six months is playing with these things since I started there, but learning how all these different things can work together. And then I can use this in my actual CI process uh, to run the test. It'll build out the exact same environment based off of that Docker file remotely. It'll run through my tests remotely. It'll make sure everything works. Uh, and if everything works, it'll actually build out a Heroku deployment instance, which uh, will push uh, all the code directly to Heroku uh, automatically for me. So my pipeline steps look a little bit like this. So I have a parallel step which runs RSpec and RuboCop uh, just to make sure everything looks good. And those two tests, if they pass, then I'm good to go. And those will run on every single build that I bring in. So if I update the RSpec, it'll run the same tests. It'll just run them for that particular branch. Um, if I push into master, it'll run my deploy step, which uses that Heroku deployment uh, tool. And then I actually run a migration here. Uh, although I did find out that there's an easier way for a pre-deployment pre on Heroku that you can do uh, where it'll run a migration step before it deploys, which is really nice. So this whole step could, could easily be removed. Um, but I'm just leaving it in there for posterity at this point. Uh, so once I get through all that, and I, my, I make a commit to the master, it looks something like this. You see in CodeShip, you'll see the uh, Postgres image get pulled in. You'll see the uh, Ruby code get pulled in. All my gems get installed, gets everything ready. And you'll see our spec here, where it shows that it passed. So I get the green check mark. RuboCop, no offenses, always good when I'm not offensive. And then you'll see a deployment step here that gets ran. And when all of that is done, 
I get one of these. So this is herokuapp.com, uh, and it's all uh, running directly in Heroku, pushed all the way through the pipeline, through the tests and everything automated, um, which is super nice. Uh, the project I based this off of, which I flashed a minute ago, but wanted to walk you through that, to do backend. So this is a great way if, especially, uh, you know, I hear some people from Iron Yard, if you're learning how to pick up different languages, uh, or you want to see how other languages work, to do backend is much like the to do MVC project. It has a whole bunch of to do APIs that allow you to uh, see how they all work uh, for the same function. And they have a client that you can run it in, which this is running my, my API that's on Heroku. So if I want to you know, add eat more pizza, I can do that. And then if I go over to my Heroku app, It doesn't get added because Heroku's slow. Hang on. Try that again. That should be there. There it is. So it's at the bottom. Just got added. Good to go. Um, that's it. I mean, it's that's sort of like, in a nutshell, how all these things work together. But, I mean, it's definitely a more complex process or can be a more complex process than what I'm showing. Um, but just sort of understanding the nuts and bolts of how all the things go together uh, will at least give you a better appreciation of DevOps or maybe give you an interest in learning it. Um, but it's, uh, it's kind of fun and it's kind of, kind of cool to give some of this a shot. Um, the one last thing is uh, I do write for Codeship as well. So if you go to blog.codeship.com slash author slash Kelly J. Andrews, uh, you can find the demo here for Ruby uh, it's in two parts, but if you want to try it out yourself, give Docker a whirl. I kind of have everything all sort of built out for you. You can give it a run and see how it goes for you. Uh, and maybe start introducing something like that in your own process. So that's it. No, uh, and mostly because I don't do it every day. Um, RSpec was kind of the one that I knew of, so I went to that first. Um, unfortunately, no, I don't, I don't really have other suggestions. Yeah, I mean, I, I assume it, any, essentially any bundle that you install it'll run it in Docker because that's just sort of how it works. You may have other requirements for the Linux kernel basically to be installed. Um, and there was some playing around that I had to do to figure out some of that initial setup. But once you get past that initial setup, it's super easy. There's also, um, I mean, if I base mine off of a Ruby uh, image, there's actually a Rails image as well, which There was. Uh, I can't find it immediately. There, th it, there are ones out there. Here we go. Like, and it may not, they may not be approved, but there are ones out there that have uh, things that you can try. And the fun thing is, a lot of these. Fun thing is kind of learning how to build these. So I mean, if you look at the Ruby container, and you go to actually like the, the Docker file itself. I mean, this will kind of show you how complex these can get. But if you're kind of a Linux whiz, this comes really easy to you. Um, I'm not, but I'm learning a lot right now. So, you know, with uh, with Linux admin, but it's it's really, I mean, it's not complex. It looks complex. You just have to break it all down. Uh, but a lot of these things you see, sort of like they run a lot in one step. Uh, to take advantage of that caching. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, once you sort of go through this piece, it's, you know, um, and you start looking at these things, you start getting ideas on how you can build your own images that fit your own uh, development processes. So that's the sort of the hard part about DevOps is there's no like rubber stamp cookie cutter pattern to say, just do it this way and you'll be fine. 
everybody's kind of different and everybody's on a slightly different path to get to the end goal. Uh, so you have to find what works for you. But yeah, we can, um, I mean, as far as like any, anything you put into a gem file, Docker should be able to, to handle it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like, sure. I mean, so just like in my Git call, right? I mean, this is pretty simple. I expect the JSON to not be empty. I expect it to equal 10. And I expect it to have a 200 status. I mean, it's not like... It goes, it goes back to your confidence level. Like what is it you think, like what would make you most confident in a test to determine that it's good to sign off on? And that would, that'll kind of give you where to, where to go with your answer. Um, you can, I mean, I've seen it both ways where you can run five tests or you can run them, all five of those things in one test. Depends on how you want to write them. Um, I don't know if there's necessarily a, a right or wrong way. There's probably a lot of different suggestions. Yeah, it's it depends on the API, right? I mean, I hate to answer a question with depends, but that's sort of the only way to answer this one is that whatever you feel like it's going to solve the business case and you cover all your, your requirements through testing that way, then if you're confident there, you should be fine. Um, there's no high or low, it's just whatever you need uh, to make sure you're covering no use case. We're trying to integrate with people who do that sort of thing uh, with more mobile apps to, to where you can commit and then we can run tests together with someone who does do that. Um, yeah, it's, I agree, it's not a great, like nothing's really great out there for, for mobile solutions. Um, the, I mean, we briefly talked about it and you said you tried it, maybe it wasn't the greatest, but. We do partner with uh, BuddyWorks, um, it's Buddy.Works, and they do uh, mobile applications, uh, CI/CD processes. So they they run all your tests and everything. Um, but yeah, it's not like I mean, it's definitely not built into CodeShip. We definitely do more uh, web applications, but uh, we're trying to integrate and partner with other people to to sort of make that work. But yeah, it's. It's hard, right? I mean, there's a lot of moving parts to a mobile app and trying to get all that tested is, I can't even imagine the headache it is just to try to make that work, so, yeah. Yes? So, how do you, um, so you represent uh, CodeShip? Yeah. So, uh, I'm kind of wondering if you could contrast the, the workflow here, your headline, your CodeShip, is you know, might be similar in some of the Yeah, it's uh, very similar in, a lot of respects. Um, we've we've geared more towards uh, private repository, enterprise software kind of development that that sort of thing. Where Travis is definitely focused more on like open source to begin with. Uh, so they have a better soft, the better a better solution specifically around open source. Not that we don't do it, but like pull requests from forked repos we don't handle, but they do. Uh, they also do a little bit better of a job with um, testing like multiple versions. So if you have like a node package you're developing or a, a gem that you're developing, you want to test with the older versions of different things to make sure it's compatible. They have a way to set that up a lot easier. You can do that with the pro version. Uh, so I showed you there's two different version flavors of CodeShip. One's a basic that's kind of UI driven and you put stuff in. Um, and it wouldn't handle this particular use case, but you could run 
with Docker on the pro side where you can build out in using different base images uh, and it would kind of build it multiple times and run the tests on those. So it's, it's doable in our software, it's, um, but Travis kind of started with that in mind. They also have like public build pages for um, that kind of thing. But. Speed, okay. speed. Um, Travis is a little, most of the people who switch to code ship from Travis will see 30, 40% increases in, or decreases in build times. So yeah, it's, it's a lot faster. And we just improved our caching on Pro, so it's even, that's gotten even better. Um, but yeah, we handle, uh, we have like better teams, I think, we have some, we have some features there that are a little more geared towards software development teams um, working to deliver products, basically. Uh, do you guys have any luck running UI tests on Docker if not headless stone? <laughs> uh, oh, coming out swinging. Um, uh, you, yeah, so like end to end. Nightwatch kind of stuff, yeah, Selenium. They're, it's really, really rough. Um, and probably one of the worst things we deal with is, so you're not alone, and I don't have a great solution. Um, they're just flaky. It's like they kind of get there, but then they kind of don't work, and then they work sometimes, or they hang. It's, it's kind of bad, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have, um, we actually have a whole series on our documentation. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we, we have some pre-built integrations that are helpful. So we have a, like some of our code coverage. Uh, we work with uh, Percy. Percy might be the other one I was thinking of. Not Buddy, but Percy. Check that one out. Anyways, um, so we have some here. Source clear, Breakman, uh, a lot of deployment it items here as well. What we do have as well is a, hang on. So where we have a, here we go, custom integrations. So this is specifically f on Pro but we kind of have a walkthrough of how to execute your commands, how to build out. A lot of it will run in a shell script, uh, especially if you're using like the pro service, you're gonna have like a Docker container. That Docker container will have uh, bash scripts in it. Those bash scripts will call out to a service, do whatever it needs to do and interact with the rest of your code. Um, in basic, you can, there's all kinds of different ways to execute commands. We also have keys. Um, that you can add directly into the UI as environment variables. Uh, so there's different ways to go about it that way. So we have, we have some solutions in place specifically for the idea of, of looking at other, um, for looking at other integration points as well. Yeah. That's all right. Oh, well, like, I mean, yeah, finance, healthcare kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of tape yeah. of all kinds of colors, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's definitely ones where getting to that point is almost impossible. Having that deliverable, that's what you want to get to then. And then all you have to do is say the hash of this one, this image with this specific hash, is, that's our release candidate. Make sure that goes through all the acceptance testing. If it's good to go, that gets deployed sort of a thing. Yeah, yeah. there are definitely industries out there like, I mean, finance is definitely one. Healthcare is another one that comes to mind. Government stuff is gonna, you know, probably gonna happen in that regard as well. So yeah, there's a lot of those out there that they put a hard stop on the deployment stuff. So you get away with it as long as you can until bureaucracy gets in the way and then you, you you find that line of where you can stop.
Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I mean, we do run into a lot of people who everything has to stay in their firewall, which is typically an issue. Um, at some point that'll go away and, and, you know, or they have a different project they want to use it on. But, um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of security things that people do tend to deal with that are not easy to get around. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a good question. And uh, actually, yes. Um, what we have is for our, specifically for our pro, we have a command line tool called Jet. Let me uh, scroll up here. Yep, hang on. Got to get it right in the right spot here. I turn. Come on. Ah. Uh, there it is. Okay. So we have Jet. And Jet will, there's a few things Jet will do for us, but it'll, you can run steps. Uh, and it'll take your pipeline, run through it all locally. So if I did it right now, I could, uh, this may take a while, but it'll go through everything and make sure it's going to work. Uh, it's going to use my local Docker cache, which sometimes bites me in the butt because I'll have something cached that isn't going to be there remotely. So I have to clear images. But uh, minor minor issue. The um, the other thing that Jet will do is we have uh, each project comes with a unique uh, encryption key. So when you have secrets, like I have um, my Heroku API key, and I ship that with my code, but I I encrypt it with our key using Jet into an encrypted file for my secrets, um, and then so that's going to go through installing, uh, which will take a minute, but. Um, so yeah, it comes up with something like this, which is if you could decrypt that, uh, you would have my API key. So I'm going to leave that up for a while. So in case anybody wants a challenge, let me know. Um, but no, it's uh, secrets are a big issue, environment variables, that kind of thing. So you you can encrypt them with Jet. Uh, but the nice thing is, yeah, is absolutely not having a testing CI, fixing CI, stupid CI, it's still broken, right? Those kind of tests. Uh, although time and time again, I, you know, every once in a while I have one that works locally, but like I had something cached or I didn't commit a file or it was ignored somewhere and I can't, so, but you, it's definitely a big help because now I can, I can go through it here and not have to wait until 10 minutes in and then I realize it's not working and I have to keep doing it. But so yeah, this is going to finish up here shortly. It's going through my migration and then I can actually deploy directly from here so I can test my deployments as well. Uh, but you'll see it went through our spec and that passed. It skipped deploy, it skipped migrate. But if I run jet steps and I use tag master, it'll run it as though it was the master branch and try to do the deployment as well so I can test everything. Um, that to me has been the biggest lifesaver out of everything we've we've made. That's it's really amazing because exactly that. Anybody else? One question, very good question. Um, you said this performs a lot better than Travis and any other tool. What is this guy Ruby? It's Ruby. Yep. 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 Uh, we have uh, some of it is in Go, I believe, as well. So we do have, uh, we have two different products. One's the basic and one's the, uh, but we have Rails with a Vue.js front end. 
uh, for our UI and then all of our runners. I believe the Docker one is written in Go and the other one is written in Ruby. But yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's pretty fast. I like it. So I started there in February uh, this year and I'd actually used them about four and a half years ago. And I, everything they do as a company I really enjoyed and um, so I had the opportunity to go work for them and I, I had to jump at it. So now I'm here. We have shirts. Uh, if you don't have your size, don't blame me. Uh, but if you want one, let me know and I can get your info and we can get you one. Um, because we, we kind of hand them out everywhere we go, but uh, there's a limited amount of sizes, so I apologize if we run out or something, but you can always hit me up and, and we'll do that. Um, outside of that, if anybody wants to go sing karaoke with me, let me know. More than happy to go. Dying. Dying. So, all right. Good. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.